Hello fellow Stitchers. Welcome once again to Stitch Bliss Corner. <laughs> I hope your day is going well and that you're stitching up a storm. <laughs> now I want to talk today about Paul Cezanne, uh, the father of modern art. Was one of his titles. Uh, and one of the reasons why I looked a bit further into him was because of the picture that I've shown you before, uh, one of his, uh, the Harlequin. And that was one that I was saying that I would very much like to stitch, but that it wouldn't be likely that there would be a chart for that particular one. So uh, my husband searched out computer programs that do charts and I've done two from two previous programs that was the wolves that I did uh, but this final program I'm going to try Harlequin on and so I'm, I'm going to test drive it for you to see how it goes <laughs> so I've got my picture there and I've got my that's my uh, key and I can show it to you because it's mine anyway so I don't have to worry there and here is just an example of the symbols that's his son Paul that uh, posed for that picture and I have my fabric all ready and gridded out. As you know I'm a great believer in gridding and this is Hardanger fabric. It looks a little bit like Ada but it isn't. And I'm hoping, because it's fairly solid, and I'm hoping that I can do two over one on that one without it getting too thick and difficult to work. I'd, it should be okay, but if it isn't, we'll all find out together, won't we? And I've also got here the frame all ready to go as well. And that'll be the size of him. And I like the silver. I think that'll be very nice against the red costume in the diamonds there. And then I've also actually printed out the big chart so that at any given time I know exactly where I am. So that's just the way I like to do it. I like to put it all together so that I can see what I'm doing. Over there. Right. Now, Paul Cezanne. He had a wealthy father. He wanted him to do law. Uh, but anyway, I'll just go back to this first. He was born in 1839 and he died in 1906. He was a modern artist whose work was a precursor for Cubism and Fauvism. Well, Picasso was somebody who was greatly influenced by Cezanne. He was from Aix-en-Provence in France, and Provence, as everybody probably knows, is a very picturesque and beautiful part of France. It's in the south of France, and there there's X down there, and there's Paris up there. Um, and there is also, what I've got here, uh, Mont Victor, which is there. Uh, Cezanne was born in the shadow of that mountain, and it influenced him all his life. Um, now, he wanted to study art, but none of the official art schools would admit him as a student. <laughs> uh, he attended drawing classes while he was studying law. His first paintings were done in dark colours. Now Pizarro, another painter, encouraged him to paint out in the sunlight, 
and then his paintings came alive with bright colours. He was an impressionist, sort of. <laughs> he painted many different subjects in multiple styles. He was a loner. He complained that he could not paint pictures of people properly. He did not achieve success until he was 56 years old. He is considered by many as being the inventor of modern expressionism. His paintings inspired Matisse and Picasso to paint their styles. And Pablo Picasso said of him, Cezanne is my one and only master. He was the master of us all. Um, so that's a little bit there. And I thought the best way probably to do it, I mean, I've got notes here, but I'm just thinking it might be better if I just go through the book about Cezanne and as I go, I can mention bits about him. That's probably more interesting for you than me wading in with all these different things. Now, I'll just do the person that influenced Cezanne, because usually there's someone that influences an artist, and it was Delacroix. And this guy, he seemed to do a lot of the scenes from the Bible or history or but he was quite dramatic as you might say and then another one of his that oh, let's just give you an idea Now, they're all done in a kind of a photographic way in that they're trying to emulate life for people because they didn't have cameras. Here's another famous one of Delacroix, the Liberty figure. Now in Paris every year the Salon, or the big art gallery, used to have, oh hang on a minute, I'll just do this so you can see what Delacroix looked like. There he is there, self-portrait. What a dashing looking man. Yes, every year there was a government sponsored ex exhibition in the Salon in Paris where all the artists of note used to send their works for people to see. And most audiences went to see classics. They went to see uh, Now, this is just pictures like that, anyway. This is just to prepare you <laughs> for some of the work that was sent by Cezanne and others. <laughs> and, of course, the audiences were expecting to see uh, pictures like that. I mean, there might be the odd one that was a bit controversial, but... Generally speaking, they were all pretty much along the same lines. So anyway, we'll just go into Cezanne. I'll get back to that shortly. I'll just show you what he looked like. Now this is him as a young man. Quite intense looking, isn't he? bit hard to see in there but anyway you can sort of dial him up on the inter internet and there's a self-portrait so quite a brooding angry man that seems like he spent a lot of his time with inner struggles um, which I think a lot of creative per people are like that aren't they they're, they're just all got all these things in their head and it's very difficult for them at times. Um, 
especially when he had a father that kept at him all the time. Anyway, this is a picture of Cezanne in later life. Uh, this book here is um, The World of Cezanne. And I think the writers, this is the Time Life series. And the writers, Richard W. Murphy. Anyway, so this is the, this snapshot, one of only 23 extant photographs of Cezanne, shows the artist when he was in his 30s with rolls of canvas and a box of paints and brushes strapped on his back. He is prepared to strike out across the French countryside in search of landscape subjects. And that's what he did a lot when he got... Once he met Pizarro, Pizarro got him out of the studio and out in, onto the landscape and painting from, from life. Uh, he used to hide in the studio a lot, but Pizarro got him out. <laughs> anyway, um, that's a better brooding picture of him there. Now, when he was a young man in Provence, he used to have a friend called Zola, Amir Zola, and Zola and him, they used to read classics together, they used to write poetry, uh, they were both fascinated by um, ancient Greece and Virgil and all those sorts of things, they quoted it at each other and everything, and they were both a big influence on each other, and Zola uh, when he got older he went to Paris to live and he used to write to Cezanne and tell him that he had to come up to Paris but Cezanne uh, he did do law and he did drawing classes uh, at the same time so he was pleasing his father but he was pleasing himself a bit as well <laughs> anyway I shall come back to that little bit there he had an excellent education, stressed the humanities, religious instruction. He was a brilliant student, won prizes in mathematics, Latin and Greek. He read classics all his life. He used to get up about four in the morning and read for two hours before he started his work. Um, he wrote verses in Latin and French and could recite Virgil from memory. Now here's a little piece of one of his poems. Dark, thick. Unwelcome mist covers me up. The sun withdraws its last handful of diamonds. And Zola said of him, My verse may be purer than yours, but yours is certainly more poetical, more true. You write with the heart, I with the mind. And Zola said to Cezanne, because Cezanne was having this inner struggle about whether he should be a lawyer or whether he should be an artist. And Zola said to him, one thing or the other, really be a lawyer or else really be an artist. But do not remain a creature without a name, wearing a toga dirtied by paint. Uh, I think Zola got away with saying things to Cezanne that, no one else could say because Cezanne had a very thin skin. They used to say he was very thin skinned and you couldn't criticise him or else he'd lash out. <laughs> so, but Zola, being a lifelong friend, <laughs> could get away with it. Right, um, now then, what else have we got here? Suddenly in the spring of 1861, his father finally yielded to the entreaties of his wife and son and agreed to let Paul drop his law studies and go to Paris to paint. And Cezanne journeyed to the capital and moved into a furnished room not far from Zola. He started attending a studio that provided a model but no instruction to prepare himself for an examination at the an influential art school in France. Now fellow students at the 
place where he was studying, remembered Cezanne's heavy Provencal accent, his rudeness of manner and his total absorption in his work. He became a kind of class joke. He was called the man without any skin because of his extreme sensitivity to criticism. Claude Monet, a year younger than Cezanne, had arrived in Paris two years before him and worked occasionally at the college. Years later, Monet recalled one of Cezanne's peculiarities that had attracted attention. He always put a black hat and a white handkerchief beside the model, said Monet, to remind himself of the two extremes between which he must establish his tonal values. Um, he was a thin, stoop-shouldered man, almost six feet tall. Uh, now, he used to he used to walk around with this red sash round his waist and speak in his provincial way of speaking, you know, as the country boy in the city with all the spivs, all the city types. Uh, and he just used to, as far as he was concerned, if it drew attention to him, I, I suppose he was one of these people, he'd rather have uh, adverse attention than none at all. So... <laughs> And apparently Manet, when he was first introduced to him, went to shake his hand and he said, oh, don't do that. I haven't washed for a week. <laughs> he used to give out a, an image of brooding menace. <laughs> don't you love it? Anyway, here's, here's one, of his, one of his pictures that he did, one of his drawings. So he's very very capable artist. <laughs> and, uh, he was always very uh, uncomfortable with nudes. Uh, I mean, he did them from time to time, but it made him feel uncomfortable. So he used to usually paint from photographs or when they were invented, um, rather than rather than do that. I don't really know why. Uh, mocking, republican, bourgeois, cold, meticulous and stingy was how the novelist Emile Zola, Cezanne's boyhood friend, described the artist's father. But Cezanne portrayed the old man with quiet dignity, seating, seated in the family living room at X, on the wall above the armchair, uh, which is a prop, is one of Cezanne's earliest li still lives. So that's a black and white one. Right, so that's one of his. Now then, we come to this salon in Paris. And as I've showed you before, the sort of paintings they were expecting were ones like that and Cezanne offered up that. Well you can imagine what the reaction was from the high society and sophisticates in Paris. Uh, each year, he submitted canvases to the Salon, the exhibition of new paintings sponsored by the official French Academy of Fine Arts, which served as the supreme arbiter of popular taste. Each year, his paintings were summarily rejected. The reasons are not hard to find. The Salon judges preferred historical or literary subjects depicted naturalistically. The great success of the 1870 Salon was Salome, that's this yellow looking that one there. By Regnault, uh, which showed mastery of texture and form, but little awareness of the psychological implications of his subject. The femme fatale who and so on it goes. Anyway, um Suzanne carefully lettered at the top of his more than six foot high canvas this figure uh, whose name and occupation was painter 
just got at the top there. And he said it was it had a great primitive strength and reveals a deep, almost cruel awareness of his friend's unhappy lot. Uh, with it, Cezanne submitted a picture of an angular reclining nude. The two works so shocked the art world with their bold departures from convention that the artist was caricatured in a Paris newspaper and ridiculed as the master of all those who paint with a knife, a brush, a broom or any other <laughs> instrument. So, now then, I'll just show you Emile Zola, who was his friend. And that was another one that used to go around with them in Provence. They all used to, they called them the inseparables. Um, and here are some of Cezanne's early works that were quite dark. That's the temptation of St. Anthony and he's, he's way back here, St. Anthony. But the, some critics said that, that this one down the bottom is the murder. Some critics said that he troweled the paint onto the canvas, which I suppose he did. Um, not all Cezanne's early paintings dwelt on the themes of violence and horror. I think that was a lot of these violent ones that were just him fighting in his head with what was expected of him and what he wanted to do, really. He had to have an outlet somewhere. Uh, not all Cezanne's early paintings dwelt on themes of violence and horror. In some of them, conventional subjects calmly treated gave proof of his efforts to control his frenzied imagination. Among the most successful of these was a series of portraits executed during his frequent visits to Aix, which he didn't like Paris. It was too busy. It was too full of probably people that he thought were very pretentious. Um, because the thing is, he had... Well, his father gave him a small amount of money to live on, but he certainly had prospects. I mean, once his father died, um, he had a lot of money. Uh, anyway, so he could indulge himself in the style that he wished to paint. Other, other artists had to do their bread and butter work. You know, they had to do their pictures of portraits of people and all that sort of thing, and then do their own kind of artwork in the time they had left. But Cezanne was someone who was able to indulge himself in that regard. So it probably made him a bit more out there because he didn't have to worry about people not liking him and not wanting him to paint their portraits because he already had an income. So that probably helped him to be a bit more out there than the others, you know, other impressionists. I mean, uh, a lot of the Impressionists were part of high society anyway, and they could walk both sides of the street. You know, they, they could be a little bit outrageous, but at the same time, uh, they were accepted. Whereas um, Cezanne, to me anyway, it seems like he was rejecting them before they rejected him, a little bit like that. You know, he made a virtue out of being alternative. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Girl at Piano shows a tranquil domestic scene in the living room of the Cezanne home, with its quiet figures carefully placed against the intricate patterns of the wallpaper and so on. And here he is. That's his sister at the piano there. And there's his mother. And she's stitching. How about that? Now that's his uncle there who used to pose for Cezanne. <laughs> I love that top one. He used to, used to put costumes on. And Cezanne was a very, very slow painter. And they say that it, he, sometimes he'd, he'd just do a tiny little bit and then he'd put his brush down and walk around the room three or four times <laughs> and come back to the canvas. 
and then he'd put another dab on and he'd go downstairs and out into the garden for a couple of minutes and then back up and put another dab on. <laughs> so um, he was a true eccentric, as you might say. Right, so anyway, let's let's go on. Oh, this, I think, um, just as a symbol of the times, swathed in scaffolding and towering above the narrow Paris streets, the Statue of Liberty nears completion in the outdoor studio of sculptor Frederick August Bartholdi, who worked on the 151-foot figure for 10 years commissioned by a sympathetic group of French citizens as a gesture of friendship to the United States. The statue, whose proper title is Liberty Enlightening the World, was taken apart and shipped to New York. There it was erected on an island in the harbour and formally dedicated in 1886. So you get an idea of the scale. So there you are, it's just something interesting there. Now here is a photograph um, of uh, Cezanne is sitting down on a seat. Pizarro, who was the one that had great influence, he was an impressionist, and he had great influence on Cezanne. And was sort of like a father figure. Uh, he gave him the gentleness, perhaps, that his own father wasn't able to give him, and encouragement. Uh, Cezanne was encouraged by his sister and his mother and Pizarro, but his father was, I think towards the end, he was a little bit more understanding of the whole thing. But, well, put it this way, Cezanne, got a mistress, had a child, got married later, and for 10 years his father didn't know that he'd married, had a mistress, or had a child. He didn't know he was a grandfather for 10 years because Cezanne thought his father wouldn't have approved of his choice of wife. So anyway, here's the picture. And there's Cezanne sitting, looking a little bit dejected there with his hat in his hand. There's Pizarro, and you can imagine him being a father figure, can't you? This fellow with the big white beard. They're almost mirrors of each other because he's got a beard as well. <laughs> Both same hair and everything. And there is his son, Pizarro's son, not, not, um, not Cezanne's son. And it says here... Um, Marie Hortense Fiquet was 19 years old, 11 years younger than Cezanne, and she was born in the small town of Saligniel, S-A-L-I-G-N-E-I-L, -E in eastern France, but moved to Paris with her family when still a child. Um, anyway, so... And they, they had a, a relationship that fascinated people because it's got, generally they adopted a derisive tone towards each other. She was apparently gregarious and Cezanne was withdrawn, conventionally bourgeois, where he was strenuously eccentric. She had no interest in the two things that absorbed Cezanne, literature and painting. When she ventured an opinion on art in the presence of others, Cezanne quickly silenced her by insisting she was only talking nonsense. But they endured. They had a long marriage. Um, yeah, what remains tantalisingly unexplained is the emotional tie that preserved his curious relationship for 40 years. Now, it'd be very nice if I showed you some of his painting, wouldn't it? But I think this is all just preparing the way a little bit. Now, I'm just going to show you this other picture here by Manet, The Art of Manet, same time like the series. And this is the picture uh, of 
Yes, what happened was the Impressionists, and I'll show you some of their work in a little while, it was painting light, it was painting uh, moments in time kind of thing, not these big classical works. Um, but anyway, they, they, all the artists that were rejected from the Salon, they staged their own exhibition, the Salon des Refuses. <laughs> um, and it says here, Monet, oh sorry, Manet, because apparently Manet put one in called Luncheon on the Grass. And I think that was the one where there were all these gentlemen sitting around and there was a naked woman lying amongst them. I think that, well, that, that caused absolute chaos. Uh, his, it says here, after the storm, his luncheon on the grass aroused. Manet waited two years before submitting another nude to the salon. His Olympia was accepted and hung, perhaps because the jury feared that rejection might lead to another salon de refuses. But it met a cyclone of abuse from both critics and the public. Although it was skied, moved to an inconspicuous place high up on a gallery wall, it drew large crowds of gawkers. Outraged propriety was the loudest cry against this unprettified Parisienne. Manet had posed his model as an elegant person <laughs> wearing a black ribbon about her neck and so on. Um, paradoxically, because they were well acquainted with such women, the Parisian shriek of outrage rang false in a city where prostitutes were princesses. So that's the work. You'll see why I've, I'm showing it to you in a moment. And there's a cat in there too. Just, just there. It's hard to see him, but he's there. I don't know quite why he put a cat in there. And what happened was, um, no painting in the Impressionist exhibition received such critical abuse as Cezanne's modern Olympia. Right, and I'll show you the picture. Here it is. That was his take on the previous painting, Olympia. And it says... Its erotic subject of voluptuous courtesan being unveiled before the lascivious gaze of a fashionably dressed bon vivant outraged the public, which often expressed its indignation physically. The owner of the painting was warned that if it were not closely guarded, it might be t returned to you torn to pieces. Its flamboyant figures and intense colours were compared by one critic to the weird shapes generated by hashish, borrowed from a swarm of bawdy dreams. The picture recalls some of Cezanne's romantic works of the 1860s, but compared with the morbid tone of those paintings, modern Olympia abounds with a healthy good humour. It was, in fact, a light-hearted satire on an earlier and more notorious Olympia by Edward Monet, Manet. Another painting above, uh, Cezanne came closer to true Impressionism. It was painted out of doors. The colours are fresh and natural. So, yes, there's his, his uh, other one. Now, a certain number of Impressionists came about because of the invention of the camera. Uh, now, because artists, before the camera came along, were used by rich people and, you know, people of means to paint members of their family and their houses and their furniture and the scenes they liked and scenes from their homes and all the rest of it to hang on their walls. And of course, when the camera came along, a lot of artists said, we're going to be unemployed soon <laughs> because the camera will do what we've been doing. And so a certain number of Impressionists that's the style of art where small dabs of paint are used, not pointillism, but more brush strokes to create an image with the light, using the light a lot rather than, 
rather than the photographic style of before. Because of course they would be exploring new ways to present their work that was different to the camera. There was a school of artists that actually wanted to copy the camera and did as close as possible to, to a camera so you could, couldn't tell the difference. But anyway, so here we are. Here's a little bit more. Uh, now, Pizarro and Cezanne, they used to go out together and paint scenes. And this is a good example here because it's got a picture by Pizarro on one side and the same scene as seen by Cezanne so that you can see the different styles of how they looked at things. Now it's got here, of all the Impressionists, Camille Pizarro influenced Cezanne's work most profoundly. It was during his visits to Pizarro's home that Cezanne began to paint from nature as the Impressionists did. There in the countryside, he and Pizarro often worked side by side using much the same techniques. The two paintings compared below, Pizarro's at the left and Cezanne's on the right, eloquently demonstrate the similarities and differences in their interpretation of the same scene. In both paintings, touches of bright pigment rather than demarcated outlines suggest the shapes of tree trunks, blossoms and shuttered windows of the houses, and so on. Um, an inescapable feeling of the outdoors pervades both works, yet Cezanne was obviously more interested in the architectural elements of the scene than Pizarro was. He was simplified, he has simplified and rearranged nature in order to concentrate on the buildings and the strong contours of the hills, imbuing his canvas with more solidarity than the Pizarro work. Aside from Cezanne's greater concern with structure, there was quite possibly a purely practical reason for the difference between the two paintings. Cezanne worked so slowly that the blossoms may very well have fallen from the trees before he could complete his picture. So, there is Pizarro's work. You can see all the brush strokes and everything. And here is Cezanne's work with more of the emphasis on the buildings. And there were people that went and observed them painting. Cezanne hated that, but they said that sometimes Pizarro would be painting away and <laughs> Cezanne would be behind him lying down, just relaxing and doing nothing. So, anyway, here's another example of the differences. There's a picture here by Renoir of Victor Choquet, I think is how you say it. And then there's um, Cezanne's. So there's the Impressionist. You can see the brush strokes there. That one is the one by Renoir. And then that one is some um, his now oh just look at the boldness of the strokes and here's a, that picture there I'll just tell you something about that um, pages of 99 here's a cartoon there and that's an expectant lady there. And there's the man at the entrance of the salon. And he's saying, this cartoon was only one of many public jibes at the Impressionist exhibition of paintings in 1877. It plays an, a sarcastic review of the show. Well, it must have been, the, maybe it was the, uh, it wasn't the salon, it must have been another one. It plays on a sarcastic review of the show that warned pregnant lady visitors away from Cezanne's mustard-toned portrait of Victor Choquet, since it might have distressing effects on their unborn children. The cartoon's caption has the frantic gendarme saying, but madam, it would not be wise. Go away. And that's the portrait there. 
and you sort of think well how you know what what were they like <laughs> but for the times that this was all i mean we're used to these sort of pictures now but in those days it was just it must have been literally scandalous to them to see big daubs of paint everywhere now here's one a close-up here uh, what Cezanne did there was conscription for the Prussia Franco-Prussian war which he did not want to be involved in so he moved to a place by the sea for a while with his wife and child and he was able then to do some coastal painting and it's got this enlarged detail of a landscape by Cezanne shows how he created forms with colour alone rather than by outlining them rigorously patterned strokes of pigment blend into trees houses rocks the slash of pure white at the left of center becomes a sailboat enforcing his notion of the picture as nothing more than a painted plane Cezanne has painted the water as an opaque flat blue area almost as solid as the underlying canvas Let's see his brush strokes there and that there just a, a daub of white and yet it's a sail isn't it he he wanted to evoke the imagination of the person looking uh, that they their image of what they saw was inside their head not necessarily what was there but what they saw appeared to be there but then he had this way of distorting faces so that the the face was not anatomically correct and that was something that picasso picked up on um, his extreme version of that was this one here where there are three expressions there like or planes of the face and Picasso it must have spurred his imagination to go along that line of art um, still life with basket of apples um, oops, sorry. he had a way of setting all his fruit out very carefully and he used to put coins underneath them to tilt them forward slightly uh, and it took him a long time to get it all just exactly how he wanted it and it sometimes it took him years to finish a painting you know and some of them were massive he had to have a special slit put in the side of his studio that his father ended up allowing him to he gave him the money to build a, a studio and it had a great slot in the wall so that the canvases could be slid in and out there was it, massive works um, and here's rocks This one he just says Cezanne believed it was unnecessary to use a drawn outline to create form drawing and color he said are by no means two different things as you paint you draw the more harmoniously colors are combined the more clearly outlines stand out when color is at its richest form is at its fullest hmm. Now, <laughs> it's a little bit of a view of his personality. In view of Cezanne's notorious inability to get along well with other people, it is remarkable that he persisted in painting them, but he did so, sometimes to the great discomfort of his models. When he painted portraits, for example, the irascible demands he often imposed on his sitters made their posing sessions miserable. 
Once in position, they were ordered to freeze in place and remain for hours on end, as immobile as the props in a still life. If they became restless and shifted their cramped muscles, he would snap, Does an apple move? <laughs> it was Cezanne's view that the human head, like an apple, could be seen as nothing more than a convenient geometric starting point for a composition in which every element, human or non-human, was treated with equal respect and attention. As a result, the most striking feature of Cezanne's brilliant and unconventional portraits is the absence of emotion and personality. Well, that's his wife there in the front cover. And, well, you can't see any personality coming through there. I mean, I think maybe there's a bit of world, not necessarily world weariness, but just a kind of all oh, my husband, you know, <laughs> who can work him out. <laughs> A little bit like that. Um, and here, uh, well, she was a good one because she did, considering what we've heard about his demands for a sitter, she, she sat quite a few times for him. So maybe that's one of the reasons why their relationship endured, because they were understanding of each other in di different ways maybe and it's got it's not surprising in view of his abiding aversion to strangers that Savan, uh, Cezanne ultimately turned out to be his own best model indeed over a 30-year period ending in his early 50s he sketched or painted his own likeness at least 36 times Of course, there's my favourite, his son Paul. Well, we'll see more of that. You'll probably get fed up with seeing it. <laughs> um, what else have we got here? There are some of his works. That that is looks so much like a Picasso to me. Oh, this is the world of Picasso. That looks very similar, doesn't it? This is considered to be one of his finest works because he was attempting to portray the humans as part of nature. I mean, they almost look like rocks in some ways on the landscape. He was trying to combine them into a whole. It, it's unfinished, uh, but most people say that it's a masterpiece. Um, now, Zola and Suzanne had a falling out because um, Zola wrote a book and it was about an artist that was always trying to find his way uh, and eventually he failed at what he was trying to do to create the art that he wanted to be happy with and he hung himself in, in the book and they never spoke again after that. Uh, it escapes me why Zola would do that to someone but maybe he had his own demons as well. Although the painter lived apart from his son much of the time, he made frequent sketches of the boy like the one seen above. Below is a photograph of Paul at 14, already a proper young man, with a walking stick, ascot, and a watch chain. There he is. 
They always look lovely when they're asleep, don't they? <laughs> but, uh, that was his wife in later life. Okay. Oh, and his studio, yes. That's, that's his studio. It's been made into a museum now. You just imagine him walking along with that bag on his shoulder with his brushes and things. And he has a little statue in his studio and that's a picture of the statue. He did so many still lives. Look at the, the glass and everything. It's just the more you look at his work, the more amazing it is, really. And this one, I don't know why, it almost brought me to tears. It's just something so moving about that. Maybe it's the blues, I don't really know. It's beautiful. And here's his beloved Mount Victoire, or the victory. I think the, uh, the, the Romans won a battle over the Teutons or something. And that's why it was called Mount Victoire. another view of it and it's just to show too that as he got older he got more and more uh, his less detail as you might say more shapes and you can see where the abstract artists came in there being influenced by him because he created such depth as well Without, without shadow in many ways. I mean, there's no, you can't really see much shadow there. Um, right. The father of us all. The patriarch of modern painting, Cezanne, is shown seated in front of his monumental bathers in his photograph, which was taken by a young artist. And what ha he vowed that he would paint until he died. And he was out painting, he got caught in a thunderstorm and he th fell down and was unconscious. And he got wheeled back to his residence on a cart and he, had, he got pneumonia. Um, and he insisted on an easel being set up next to his bed and he was doing water, a watercolour on that uh, yeah and Cezanne said the cylinder the cone and the sphere everything in nature and life can be portrayed by one of those shapes <laughs> now he was asked to attend uh, a, a little group of artists towards the end of his life and he did attend and this is what Mary Cassatt daughter of a wealthy Pittsburgh banker who was living in Paris um, she was an artist and this is what she said of him when I first saw him I thought he looked like a cutthroat with large eyeballs standing out from his head in a most ferocious manner a rather fierce looking pointed beard and an excited way of talking that positively made the dishes rattle. I found out later that far from being fierce or cutthroat, he was the gentlest nature possible. He doesn't believe that everyone should see alike. Others said he was like a monk. He was a recluse. Gauguin said that Cezanne was like a shepherd of ancient times, sitting on a hill contemplating. He was a philosopher. 
Um, so, sometimes you wonder if he was like that, Cezanne was like that, because he wanted to be left alone to paint in peace. Because if you're a friendly person, you get people coming up and interrupting you all the time. And he was too busy for all that sort of thing. Um, and I've written something here. There is a certain amount of selfishness in an artist, but they have an obsession, a need to create the ideal, which is a need, but frustrating at the same time because they are desperate to put onto paper what their minds conceive. So it is a need, not necessarily selfish at all, because we all want peace. And that is what they are seeking, peace of mind, a resting place where they feel fulfilled. But for many tortured artists, it never comes. Towards the end of his life, Cezanne mentioned glimpsing the promised land. And will he be able to enter? I hope, I think he probably could. <laughs> stitchers can relate to this. How often do I hear stitchers say that they have to stitch, need to stitch, calm down to find that place? There is a difference with many stitches because we have a chart, but that chart does not always give us peace, does it? The fabric gives us some grief. The threads give some grief. The colour palette gives some grief. The end product that you have in your mind's eye often does not end up the way you expected. Sometimes you are unexpectedly delighted, and other times your worst fears are realised. Yes, stitches and artists are very alike. Some would say the same. Well, that was quite a journey, wasn't it? And I think the thing with his work was how much it dominated his entire life. He was, he could have written poetry. Zola said he was as good as him. He could have had an easy life with his feet up in the sun, enjoying life. But there was that inner drive in him. And his influence is experienced by us all, even if we don't realise it, in the different artworks and even, you know, clothing designs, everything. So anyway, that's all I have to say this time. Thank you very much for your company. And um, I'm looking forward to getting Harlequin started. I was wanting to show you Harlequin, the one that's being framed. But he, the framer, I don't know how it happened, but he used the wrong mat, the wrong colour. So it's still at the framers. So when Harlequin comes back, he will be joining me in my next episode uh, so happy stitching to everybody and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.